All of these years later, it's a story that many in the community still prefer not to discuss, perhaps because it's disappointing that for all of the positive stories that have ever come out of Quincy, that this one has to exist too. But there's no hiding it. This is one of Quincy's scars. It was just over 30 years ago that Michael Swango used Quincy as a stop in his haunting journey as a serial killer. I spoke with a few people who were there before anyone understood how much evil Michael Swango was capable of. Coming in my shift, I started at 8 a.m. and I walked into the paramedic quarters and off to the left, there was a gentleman they introduced me to as my new partner for the day, uh, meet Dr. Michael Swango. He had a great mind, uh, was very smart, was a good paramedic. Big smile on his face, uh, clean cut, friendly. Brent Unmasig and John Landis were struck by his charisma. Michael Swango always seemed to make a good first impression. Dan Cook saw a determination in Swango when he was one of his teachers at Christian Brothers High School in Quincy. Swango graduated as valedictorian from there in 1972. One of the brightest students I ever had. Now, I don't know if he was the most intelligent, but he worked extremely hard at his studies. He excelled at Quincy College, too. And in 1984, he worked as a paramedic in Quincy. But that first impression faded quickly. Swango had some serious quirks. He always kept uh, scrapbooks, and he would bring the scrapbooks to work. And in his spare time, uh, he would go through several different newspapers and cut out stories and paste them into scrapbooks. And of course, the stories he was always interested in were the ones that included some type of uh, bizarre accident or death. One morning, Brent Unmasig arrived for his shift, and the overnight crew was talking. They were talking about a call that they had in the middle of the night. Um, and it was, I think, a one vehicle accident. They arrive on scene only to see Swango on top of the roof of the car. In plain clothes, he starts firing off pictures. He had pictures of the individuals in that car. There was a lot about Swango you wouldn't call normal. Still, he was kind enough to bring in a box of donuts for his coworkers. Nothing wrong with the kind gesture. That is, until about 20 minutes after Unmasik took his first bite. I just kind of felt this turning sensation in my stomach, and it was just a matter of time before I started vomiting. And the next night, Unmasig and Swango were on duty for a high school football game. Here I am at the football game, it's halftime, and he offers to buy me a Coke. For Unmasig, that Coke turned into three days of violent illness. I would go down to the paramedic quarters, and there would always be a fresh iced tea made in the refrigerator. Landis made the mistake of taking a few sips, it was clear these kind gestures were tainted, and it was because of Swango. The other paramedics decided to search his bag one day. Well, there was a full bottle of Terrell Ant Killer and an empty bottle of Terrell Ant Killer. They went to authorities, and on October 26, 1984, Swango was arrested and quickly posted bail. Unmasig saw him later that day when Swango returned to the hospital. We're right outside the hospital entrance to the ER when he walks up to us and I'm just absolutely stunned. I'm like, I cannot believe he's, he's here. So he looks at us, walks right on by us, goes through both double doors and proceeded to walk down a hallway and that led him down another hallway and at that point in time I, I don't know which, you know, I don't know where he's going. But that hallway uh, to the end of that hallway leads to the uh, exterior doors and he walked outside we're standing there just trying to figure out where, where's, where's, he, where's he at right now. And he was walking along the sidewalk and now we actually see him. He was on that sidewalk, walked up to a telephone pole and then uh, crossed his arms and kicked up his leg up on that pole and just stared at us for the entire time. Now experts tested samples of that iced tea. They tested hair and fingernail samples from the paramedics. What they found was arsenic, and with a large enough dose, it's lethal. Tomorrow night on KHQA News at 10, I'll take you through the trial of Michael Swango in Quincy. We'll be back in a moment. Michael Swango was arrested in October 1984 for allegedly poisoning his co-workers with ant poison. In the months that followed, Swango himself was followed. Authorities watched his apartment, squad cars tailed him during his morning jogs, and he was more than just your average suspect at this point. It seems no one was quite sure what Swango might do next. Perhaps the only certainty was that his next move 
would be determined in a courtroom. And as fate would have it, the man who once knew him as an exemplary student now knew Michael Swango as his client. The same sales clerk testified that from her personal experience, the two bottles of tarot and killer that Swango allegedly purchased from her was an unusually large amount for a single purchase. I walked in there and told the jailer who I wanted to see, and he said, well, I'll go get him. He said, I'll have to move this, uh, this individual. And I turned around and looked, and it was Mike. He was sitting there, and I said, I said, what are you doing here? And he says, he gave me the look, and he says, I don't know. It was a chance encounter that brought Dan Cook and Michael Swango back together. Once Swango's teacher at Christian Brothers High School, Cook now practices law. He and Swango have prepared months for this trial to be heard by Judge Dennis Cashman. It was a, essentially a circumstantial evidence case. Uh, no one ever actually saw him put poison in donuts or saw him put poison in iced tea or saw him put poison in soda. April 22nd, 1985. Cook was confident as the trial began. Swango's bench trial would come down to his testimony versus that of the paramedics. Though Swango maintained his innocence throughout, he might not have fully grasped who was really on his side. Strangely enough, when you talk about the paramedics, he wanted me to call all the paramedics as witnesses for him. And uh, you know, I, I think he began to realize finally that the paramedics weren't for him. Well, their testimony was very compelling. Uh, it, was, it was very thorough. The things they had to say about Swango that were relevant and material to the case were so strange and, and uh, unique, if you will, that it certainly had a ring of truth to it because you wouldn't think anybody could make something up like that. In his testimony recounting the two alleged incidents, Unmasig recalled two conversations he had with Swango, one in which Swango described the ultimate ambulance call he would like to make. He described that as a busload of children being hit head-on by a tanker truck full of gasoline. Several of Swango's co-workers focused on the odd comments he would make about trauma and death while on the job. Swango played it off as gallows humor, simply his way of finding humor among the harsh realities of a taxing profession. Few, if any, bought it. I knew that what he was saying kind of makes sense on the surface, but when you really unveil his character, he is a very dark individual. Then came a major issue, which occurred months before the trial. He goes to Florida. He comes back, you know, early in January, and I'm in sitting in the office to get a phone call. Mr. Cook, yes, I said, what is it? And he said, why don't you come out here right now? Swango's apartment was crawling with red ants, Reason enough for him to keep syringes full of ant poison, which investigators found upon searching his place. But it was apparent these ants weren't native to the area. Swango had brought them back from Florida. In his defense, he's saying he's, he has this pre-filled syringe and he's, you know, injecting up in the air at these ants to kill them. Um, but the reality is that we believe that was a vial for his next victim. Judge Cashman was left with the decision, and on May 3rd, he ruled. Swango was guilty on five of six charges of aggravated battery. When I determined the outcome, I was never any more certain of a guilty verdict than I was of that one. The five sentences were served concurrently. The maximum stay the law would allow was five years. However, Swango only served two and a half, thanks to his good behavior as an inmate. In August of 1987, Michael Swango was a free man. We were uh, notified that, you know, as, uh, as I guess as victims, that he would be released. And, you know, you just, we just don't know. I mean, we all started talking because I, I'm, I'm still working on the ambulance. You know, what, what potentially, where does he go? Does he come back here to Quincy? Now, sometime after Swango was sentenced, Judge Cashman told me he received a Christmas card from Michael Swango. Cashman knew it was authentic because of Swango's unique signature. Was it some type of threat? Maybe. Perhaps it was Swango's way of letting those know who outsmarted him, I haven't forgotten you. Watch KHQA News at 10 tomorrow to learn more about how Swango ended up where he is today, including the passage from his diary that helped get him there. We'll be back in a moment.